All right. So I am uh, Daryl McLeod, and I am a pediatric uh, urologist at Nationwide Children's Hospital in Columbus, Ohio. Uh, just chatting with Michelle about how uh, we have cold temperatures and recent snow here, and um, she's enjoying warm temperatures and sun out in um, sunny California. But hopefully people are joining us from all around the country and uh, are doing well on this, uh, this uh, Tuesday evening. So um, what I wanted to talk about today was uh, predicting kidney outcomes in children with posterior valves. And this is a topic that is, um, I'm very passionate about, and I uh, see a lot of patients uh, in clinic um, with posterior valves. I actually um, staff a clinic with uh, two of our nephrologists uh, where we see patients together um, in the same uh, clinical encounter uh, where I can address their urologic needs and the nephrologist can address their, um, their kidney health needs as well. And I think this is a really important uh, collaboration and it's led to some research uh, interest as well. Uh, so for this talk, I'm going to talk uh, some of uh, which about um, uh, some data that's uh, been done by multiple investigators um, recently and then also some of my own data um, that I wanna share with you guys. Um, so um, I'll try to keep an eye out for the chat um, button, um, but uh, if I don't catch it during the presentation, I'll be happy to go back and um, answer any questions, um, I certainly will check it at the end. So I don't have any disclosures. And um, as I kind of mentioned, um, the purpose or my aims of this study is to talk about the risk of chronic kidney disease progression in um, posterior valves, uh, the importance of um, predicting um, chronic kidney disease in these high-risk patients, uh, the current state of prediction, and um, future directions. So. I'm assuming that the majority of the audience uh, is uh, pediatric urology uh, or urology or potentially um, medical students interested in urology. So I, um, I'm gonna not go into detail uh, of too much about what posterior valves actually is, um, but it, it is um, uh, really well represented by this picture here on the left, uh, which is a, a cystoscopic uh, or ure urethroscopic um, photo of the posterior urethra in a child with posterior valves. It's actually a very anatomically simple abnormality where you have uh, leaflets um, that rise up from the uh, base of the posterior urethra uh, at the bottom of the vero montanum and um, acts as uh, sails um, when uh, there's uh, integrated flow of urine. Uh, those sails cause obstruction, a partial obstruction that backs up into the bladder and really um, causes devastating effects uh, on the uh, bladder and upper urinary tract. The VCUG uh, picture on the right is a patient of mine um, who really has devastation of their urinary tract where you can see um, if the posterior urethral valve uh, was in this region right here, um, you have a dilated uh, posterior urethra, very abnormal thickened bladder wall, uh, with diverticulum and trabeculation, uh, and then um, dilation of the uh, urinary, uh, upper urinary tract as well, um, signified by bilateral um, high-grade hydronephrosis. And um, you can even see, um, some, likely due to high pressure, um, some uh, pilovenous backflow uh, here. So uh, these kids uh, have a very potential for some very um, significant uh, kidney damage um, from a very simple uh, appearing obstruction of the posterior urethra. Now, as you also probably know, um, this is a disease that affects multiple organ systems, um, um, not only the, the, the urinary tract, but also uh, the pulmonary system uh, due to oligohydraminose um, during field development. And the reason why um, many of these children uh, do not survive either fetal development or uh, shortly after birth is due to their respiratory compromise. Um, but I'm not going to focus on um, the respiratory side of things today. I'm going to focus on um, the renal outcomes. So posterior fill valves occurs in one in 5,000 to one in uh, 8,000 uh, male births. So it's rare, um, but it's, it's frequent enough that it is something that a major academic pediatric uh, urology center uh, will see uh, multiple cases a year. I think probably here at Nationwide, uh, we'll, we'll see somewhere around uh, one case a month, maybe 12 a year. So it is defined as a partial bladder outlet obstruction, uh, which results in uh, dilation of the posterior urethra, um, abnormal development of the uh, bladder, uh, distension of the upper urinary tracts to some degree. What we know is that 15 to 20% of patients with um, 
post-urethral valves will progress to end-stage kidney disease at some point during childhood. And this number varies depending on how the study is done, uh, but I think that this is a pretty good estimate of what to expect when counseling families. So the question that I have um, in my clinical and um, research uh, endeavors is really to define who will need renal replacement therapy, which kids will end up in this bucket of um, the 15 to 20% who require um, renal replacement therapy, either in um, uh, dialysis or uh, renal transplant, or also of importance is which kids will have chronic kidney disease um, that may progress to higher levels of chronic kidney disease that also has um, added uh, morbidity, um, just being in a higher CKD stage. So why is it important to predict who will progress to, to end-stage kidney disease? Well, the first thing is if we improve risk stratification, we can better uh, and more accurately um, counsel uh, patients and families. It also allows an opportunity for early intervention. And if we're able to intervene earlier in patients that appear to be progressing, then there's actually a possibility for modification of the disease course and maybe preventing or delaying progression in certain children. And then lastly, the topic which is uh, important that's often missed is preemptive transplant has become, uh, in the nephrology field, uh, an important concept where the outcomes of transplant um, are better if a patient uh, is not a need to be bridged with dialysis, whether that being peritoneal or hemodialysis. So getting a, a patient uh, preemptively on a transplant list, and, and by doing so, um, knowing which patient will soon progress um, is really of utmost importance. So why do some patients progress and others do not? Why is it such a spectrum in patients with posterior urethral valves where you might have a patient that's born with virtually normal kidneys who live a normal life, and then you have other patients who are born or even don't survive fetal development, but then are born uh, to soon uh, progress to kidney failure um, sh shortly after birth? And the way that I like to think about this is kidney injury and posterior urethral valves being a dynamic process, where really there's two overlapping mechanisms. There's the fetal obstruction, which leads to abnormal embryology, and the kidney and the bladder develop abnormally, and this is something that's going to affect them for the rest of their life. But it's a static process, as compared to the more dynamic process where there's postnatal insults that occur throughout life. So the baby's born with some level of embryologic injury to the kidney and the bladder, but then they go throughout life having to deal with these serial insults in the postnatal period. Persistent bladder out obstruction certainly can occur. This is why uh, we recommend after the initial valve ablation to do a VCUG to confirm that the valves have been ablated. And if there's any concern, a relux cystoscopy, a relux cystoscopy is often important to make sure that the valves have been appropriately treated. Even if the valves are appropriately treated, there's a functional obstruction that also occurs at the bladder neck. So obstruction is not something that goes away the moment that you treat these children's valves. Valve bladder is uh, something that was initially described by Mitchell uh, many years ago, many decades ago. And it's a, it's a dyna dynamic process as well, where in young children, uh, the bladder is um, low capacity, poor compliance, and has high pressures. And then over time, the bladder decom decompensates to a low pressure floppy system that has high residual where both of these um, processes can lead to uh, damage to the, um, to the kidneys through varying mechanisms. Vesicle ureter reflux is also common uh, in patients with uh, post urethral valves, which acts as a, not only a conduit for bacteria to get up to the kidneys, but also can uh, lead to a pseudo residual where high urine um, flow up to a uh, dilated upper tract, then refluxes or then antegrade comes back down to the bladder and refills the bladder after voiding. The inability of the bladder to ever live in an empty state um, can contribute to um, the progression of valve bladder syndrome. Urinary stasis is also something that occurs uh, in patients with uh, post urethral valves due to the dilation of the upper urinary tract, which can increase the risk for urinary tract infections. Uh, recurrent urinary tract infections in the form of pyelonephritis uh, can lead to scarring and uh, further injury of an already um, abnormal kidney. Because uh, children are often born with um, a lower than normal nephron mass, uh, these nephrons are uh, sometimes asked to work uh, extra hard and you can have hyperfiltration injury. 
Uh, scarring and um, renal dysplasia can lead to hypertension and proteinuria, which can then, in effect, um, if not treated, um, lead to uh, hastening of the progression of the chronic kidney disease. Uh, oftentimes, we see in children with postureal valves that there's polyuria, um, which is due to concentrating defect. Uh, this concentrating defect um, uh, leads to a large amount of uh, volume of urine, uh, which uh, can also uh, impact um, valve bladder syndrome and progression. The renin angiotensin system is also appears to be uh, overactive uh, in patients with posterior valves and is an area of, of focus for research. So I really uh, think that the best way to look at progression in kids with posterior valves and the fate of the kidney is this intersection uh, between uh, fetal uh, obstruction and postnatal insults. With this being said, there's two main time points where uh, progression to uh, kidney uh, failure typically occurs in patients with posterior valves. Uh, this is a study that we did um, through our Pediatric Urology Midwestern Alliance, and it's really important to have these alliances so that we can uh, look at large numbers of children in such a rare disease. Uh, but we were able to define a birth cohort of patients, um, uh, 273 boys um, across the five institutions, and look at their uh, progression to end-stage kidney disease. What we found here is that there's two main uh, uh, peaks or times um, when uh, children uh, tend to progress. The first year of life is a time where typically um, this is going to be a child that just has really poor renal reserve and they require dialysis early in life. There's then a honeymoon period, if you will, where there's not much change uh, until these uh, children reach uh, the peripubertal age where uh, they increase their muscle mass, um, have hormonal changes, and they stress their kidneys um, and have a second wave of progression. Analyzing this group of patients, uh, what we found is that about 9% progressed um, to requiring renal replacement therapy uh, by one year of age, 16 by 10 years, and then about 25% by 13 years of age. So focusing on the fetal obstruction or the embryologic part um, of, of the picture, what this really represents is the functional renal mass at birth. So children with post valves undergo an embryologic injury, whether that's from abnormal actual development of the kidney or uh, a pressure injury that occurs due to the uh, obstruction. But as often these kids are born with abnormal functional mass at birth. And the question is, is how can we measure um, which patients are going to have abnormal functional uh, renal mass at birth? And the earliest time period that we could potentially look and try to risk stratify these patients is in fetal urine. And this is really exciting uh, data coming out of uh, France where they are using proteomics to try to uh, identify potential fetal biomarkers that would predict uh, later progression in children with posterior valves. So they were able to um, acquire amniotic fluid samples uh, in patients that had a, a diagnosis of uh, PUV. Uh, and as you know, uh, amniotic fluid is a representative of fetal urine in the second and third trimester. Uh, they uh, have the capability of using capillary electrophoresis um, coupled with mass spec, um, which uh, only requires very small aliquots of uh, fetal urine, which is important because this is not an easy uh, sample to get. Um, you know, urine in a young child, uh, we have um, very easy as pediatric urologists access to, um, but uh, getting fetal or amniotic fluid is, is a whole other story. Uh, but this, this group was able to um, acquire fetal urine um, from patients and actually um, identify over 4,000 uh, different peptides uh, through um, this uh, mass spec procedure. They then stratify these patients um, to progressing or non-progressing to end-stage renal disease uh, in the next two years. And what they identified is these 12 proteins um, that they call the 12 PUV model uh, that they saw were elevated in the group that progressed to end-stage renal disease. So they went on to a validation phase uh, where they tested um, this 12 PUV on 38 um, patients in a, um, in a blinded, um, unbiased fashion uh, and compared uh, them to the group of patients that were known to progress um, to end-stage renal disease versus the ones that were not. And they uh, did, in fact, find that this 12 PUV score uh, was associated with risk of progression, uh, where you can see here um, the uh, group uh, of non-progressors, um, or sorry, the, the, the um, no end-stage renal disease um, was 
uh, was much lower um, in these numbers as compared to the end-stage renal disease patients, which has a much higher score of the 12 PUV. So this is uh, really exciting that they were ident identified this group of markers that could potentially predict which patients uh, would progress um, with samples uh, acquired during uh, a fetal uh, development. They went on to um, look at the uh, accuracy of the test, um, looked at sensitivity, specificity, positive and negative predictive values um, for this 12 PUV. And they did identify uh, that um, there was a relatively high um, sensitivity, specificity, positive and negative predictive values, uh, especially in comparison to other markers that are known um, to be looked at in fetal urine, like um, beta-2 microglobulin and um, sodium levels. Um, they also looked at ultrasound parameters and, as well, and um, none of the other parameters um, showed anywhere close to the level of um, sensitivity, specificity, positive, negative, predictive value as this 12 PUV did. So the investigators um, have now gone on to um, create this antenatal um, uh, consortium across Europe. Um, I'm not going to read this, an ac this acronym since it's very long, um, but basically this is a um, consortium of 30 European centers um, where they're um, enrolling PUV pregnant, pregnant patients or patients um, who are pregnant with PUV fetuses. Um, they started enrollment in 2017 and they want like to complete enrollment in 2021 um, and have uh, two years of follow-up. So the study um, should be ready for analysis at, in 2023. Uh, but the goal is to look at the endpoint of renal and patient uh, survival at two years postnatally um, to validate uh, this PUV12 model. Um, and they hope to um, recruit 400 patients for this. So this is um, ongoing and very exciting um, research that's coming out of uh, Europe. Um, uh, my colleagues here at Nationwide and myself are actually working to collaborate um, with um, one, one of the, the lead authors on this project uh, to, to try to um, get samples of uh, fetal urine. So this is, this is some pretty exciting um, uh, data in the pipeline. Moving on to genetics, um, you know, as urologists, this is not necessarily something that we think about often, um, but there's uh, some exciting uh, information that's uh, recently been published about uh, using something called copy number variants to try to determine um, uh, which uh, patients will uh, potentially be progressors or non-progressors in uh, posterior valves. So copy number variants are these regions of the human genome that are either gained or lost compared to a reference genome. And these genomic-wide um, scanning is, is uh, possible through microarray technologies. And so what happens is these microarrays are able to detect chromosomal imbalances. And these DNA imbalances um, have been shown to contribute to birth defects and other diseases, uh, one of which um, has been um, shown to be associated is actually renal function. Um, so this, uh, this study looked at 45 boys with posterior valves and uh, evaluated their peripheral blood or saliva for any um, copy number of variations and found that there was 13 uh, variations identified in 12 of the boys, um, which was about a third of the cohort. And so they then looked at uh, outcomes, which included the nadir serum creatinine in the first year of life and estimated GFR at one in five years and requirement for um, renal replacement therapy. Um, this is a very busy slide, and I uh, only put this up here um, to kind of show that these are the different um, copy number um, variants um, that they found, and that most of them have unknown significance um, so far. Um, this one here um, being, you know, a urologically known disease, uh, Noonan syndrome. In pediatric urology, we often will see patients with Noonan syndrome since they have undescended testicles. Um, but most of, most of these um, copy number variants, which are either duplications or deletions on varying um, chromosomes, um, have no known um, significance yet. Um, um, they also looked at um, what regions um, these um, copy number variants are on varying chromosomes, and um, uh, there are um, some that seem to be in the same region as other known urogenital um, abnormalities. Um, so um, this is promising that these copy number variants could potentially be used to predict um, outcomes in kids with posterior valves. Um, so what they did was they looked at their two cohorts, um, the cohort of patients who had these copy number variants, which was 12 versus their um, negative copy number variant patients, which was 33. And they found that there actually was an association with nadir creatinine, um, where the uh, creatinine nadir um, uh, much higher in the copy number variant positive group. The GFR at one year was, significant, was lower, um, 80 versus 103. And then at five years, uh, 45 versus 102. 
Um, so this is very promising that there's an association uh, potentially between these copy number variants and um, kidney outcomes. They then uh, looked at um, the um, survival, the um, uh, kidney uh, free, free survival of patients with copy number um, positive variants and found um, that um, if you did have copy number variants, uh, you were more likely um, to progress at an earlier rate um, to stage five kidney disease. So um, in conclusion of this study, uh, these are pretty exciting findings that um, these copy number variants can um, potentially um, signify uh, early onset of renal failure in uh, children with uh, posterior valves. Um, you know, these samples were taken of um, newborns. Um, however, it's feasible that prenatal detection um, using copy number variants um, could be performed as well um, through a CVS or amniocentesis. Um, and um, certainly validation is necessary, but this is early preliminary evidence to suggest um, that uh, there's a potential utility in these copy number variants uh, in progression of um, PUV. Another uh, mechanism uh, that has been investigated to look at kidney outcomes is the characteristics of the initial ultrasound um, at birth. And this is um, a study that's uh, out of uh, Canada. Uh, Dr. Braga's group um, has looked at um, patients with posterior valves. They have a 75 patient cohort um, where they uh, looked at both ultrasound and biochemical parameters um, on the initial uh, ultrasound of uh, children with postural valves for the outcome of GFR at last follow-up and the need for renal replacement therapy. Uh, in their group of 75 patients, they have 16 who have progressed, and they did uh, find significant associations with um, both their renal parenchymal area and cortical medullary differentiation scores um, in patients with and without CKD5. Uh, they also found that renal length uh, was predictive on univariate analysis, but this um, association was lost on the multivariate analysis. They then did a sensitivity analysis to look at the appropriate cutoff value for the total renal parenchymal area and found 12.4 uh, uh, centimeter squared appeared to be the best uh, cutoff value and then uh, uh, placed it into a survival model and found that patients uh, with uh, the uh, renal parenchymal area less than 12.4 um, had a significantly uh, quicker progression um, to uh, uh, end-stage kidney disease uh, than the greater than 12.4 uh, group. So in conclusion, this study um, uh, identified both estimates of renal parenchymal quantity, being the total parenchymal area, and quality, the cortical medullary differentiation, as um, prognostic value for determining the future risk of um, stage 5 chronic kidney disease. Um, so you know, I think future studies really should look at um, the potential of adding um, these values to um, risk stratification uh, tools. Uh, so, you know, a, a talk wouldn't be complete talking about um, risk factors for progression in post valves without talking about uh, pop -off, the pop-off mechanism. Uh, this is something that's been uh, discussed for a long time in pediatric urology. In fact, in the early 1980s, uh, Dr. Duckett uh, first described uh, vesicoureteral uh, reflux and unilateral renal dysplasia, or VURD syndrome. Um, this is a finding on uh, early ultrasound and VCUG where you have high-grade reflux in one side, uh, resulting in renal dysplasia of that uh, ipsilateral kidney and a normal contralateral kidney. And the thought was is that this um, high-pressure pop-off to the one side uh, preserved or spared the function of the contralateral kidney. And there was early evidence that backed up this theory. However, uh, it, it does appear um, that this uh, association is not as strong as once thought. And there's um, conflicting data um, currently of the actual uh, predictive ability of a uh, patient that you uh, are, are noted to have VURD. Uh, and the same uh, class of, uh, of findings of VRD is uh, general pop-offs, including the urinoma. Uh, large bladder diverticulum, urinary ascites, and uh, patent urachus. All of these are mechanisms for a bladder to release pressure and potentially take pressure, or bladder or kidney to release pressure and potentially take some of the pressure injury off of a kidney. Um, it was initially thought that these pop-off mechanisms could also improve long-term renal outcomes. However, uh, contemporary data does not seem to suggest that these have a strong association. This is going to bring us to probably the, the most strong evidence that we currently have for prediction of renal outcomes. 
and that's the um, serum uh, create a, uh, nadir serum creatinine in the first year of life. Um, so as I think most of you know that the newborn's creatinine uh, refle reflects maternal serum creatinine. And uh, once uh, the baby's born and there's no longer um, shared circulation between the placenta, the baby and the mom, um, the baby's kidneys kick in and start to filter the uh, blood themselves. And the creatinine will go from the normal maternal level, which is often uh, around one, down to a normal level in a, a newborn child, which is typically around 0.3. Um, however, even though it comes down in the, typically in the first few days after birth, the kidneys in uh, newborns um, will continue to mature actually through the first year, or potentially even the second year of life uh, until a normal GFR is reached. Uh, and that's why typically we don't use the creatinine until we've given a period of time uh, and what we found in um, multiple studies is, is the first year of life or the nadir creatinine in the first year of life um, appears to be one of the best predictors of uh, renal reserve, nephrons at birth, and then um, long-term prediction of kidney outcomes. And um, this is something that I um, have also um, had the opportunity to look at uh, with the Pediatric Urology uh, Midwest Alliance, where we uh, looked at patients uh, in our birth cohort um, who had um, serum of creatinine values available, and we broke them down into uh, groups where um, patients uh, with a creatinine uh, nadir less than 0.1 uh, found that none of these patients uh, progressed to kidney failure um, over our follow-up. If they were creatinine uh, nadir to 0.4 to 0.69, 2% uh, uh, progressed by 10 years. Um, 0.7 to 0.99, 27 had pro progressed by 10 years, and then all patients actually progressed um, by eight years of age if their serum creatinine um, was greater than uh, greater or equal to one. And so this um, kind of leads to um, the next discussion, which is that patients with posterior valves um, using nadir serum creatinine can really be broken down into four main groups. There's the early progressors, um, the kids that are just born with really bad kidneys, um, the late progressors um, were kids that are born with um, pretty poor uh, renal reserve, um, but since um, their bodies are so small and their needs are so small in infancy and even early childhood, um, most of them do not progress um, until they start to get a little bit older. And then you have the variable progressors where not all, pe not all children in this group will eventually progress, uh, but some will. And then you have the non-progressors where uh, they are pretty much born with uh, enough kidney function to last them at least through childhood. The variable pro progressor group is, I think, one of the most important groups here because this is potentially the group that we could intervene, uh, specifically in bladder management, uh, to try to change the natural course of disease. Patients in the early progression group are unlikely going to benefit um, since the um, you know, the writing is really on the wall, unfortunately, with their kidneys. Uh, but this group out here, uh, I think as urologists, we have an opportunity to potentially intervene and change their progressive course. So serum nadir creatinine, as well as newborn imaging, fetal urine, and genetics, it's really only half the story, especially as urologists. We are really tasked with managing these patients after the damage is already done. And these patients here, or sorry, these variables here really are measuring the damage that is already done. Um, but as kids go through childhood and then enter adolescence and go into adulthood, there's, there's many more insults that are potential that can occur to the kidney. Um, and we really need prediction tools that reflect those changes over time, not just uh, the, re the renal reserve that patients are born with. So this brings us really to the right side of the slide, are the postnatal insults, and are there ways that we can follow these postnatal um, factors uh, as, as patients go through childhood? So urodynamics is certainly one avenue um, that we, we can look at. Um, this is a nice study looking at a large cohort of posterior valve patients where they followed um, urodynamic parameters um, over time to see um, how they affected their um, five-year five outcome of, um, of kidney uh, function. Um, they looked at bladder contractility index and bladder um, outlet obstruction index. And what they found was that, um, among other things, but they focused on the bladder contractility index, that this is a strong predictor um, of patients who um, would progress to, um, to th their kidney failure would progress. And this is not an unsurprising finding since we know as urologists that the bladder um, is extremely abnormal in kids who have uh, PUV in that um, any added um, pressure um, from a, a poorly uh, 
managed bladder uh, has the potential not only for further pressure injury, uh, but also uh, recurrent uh, urinary tract infections, pyelonephritis, and just on ongoing insults to an already abnormal kidney. They then went on to stratify their bladder contractility index into three groups and found that patients um, in the worst, worst group um, had a, a steeper um, loss of um, function, um, their cumulative renal survival as compared to the intermediate and the, um, the higher contractility index uh, group. So moving on to some of the research that I, I have been working on, uh, looking at biomarkers that can be um, followed over time instead of just um, the static um, uh, one-time measurement of serum nitrate creatinine in the first year of life has brought me to uh, study a, a very um, really good uh, database um, for anyone out there that wants to look at kidney outcomes because um, it's a longitudinal database. Um, it's a prospective observational study um, with kids with mild to moderate CKD um, that follows uh, patients over time. And so there, there's definitely some disadvantages to using this study, um, but it was, um, has really um, offered me um, some opportunities to study these markers um, as, as they change over time. So the first study that I did was looking at common clinical markers. These are markers that are, you can order right now for your patients in the lab. Um, they're not novel markers that you need to do research protocol or do ELISA's on. These are markers that you can order right now. Um, and I wanted to see um, in this nested case controls um, setting within CKID, where cases are patients who progressed to require dialysis or transplant and controls um, had not progressed over the course of their follow-up, if any of these um, variables um, predicted which patients would progress and which would not. And we found that uh, at baseline, um, which is about five years before the outcome for most patients, um, certainly the GFR um, was, was lower in the patients who would be progressing over the next five years, which is not unsurprising. But so is the urine protein to creatinine, the urine microalbumin to creatinine. Um, these patients had acidosis at baseline, and they also were anemic at baseline. Um, so this is really, re this is really um, these findings really showed, showed us that we could potentially um, use these markers as prediction tools of who um, would progress over the next five years. Uh, what we then did is we wanted to follow for changes over time, and we, we noted that uh, for the urinary markers, both the microalbumin and the protein to creatinine um, significantly increased as compared um, to the patients who didn't progress, um, showing that this could be something that could be followed over time as more of a dynamic um, marker than just a one-time measurement. And as they um, start to rise, um, get, as they get closer to the endpoint. Similarly, with the, with the serum markers that we looked at, phosphate, hemoglobin, and albumin all had statistically significant um, slopes um, compared to the control group. So we then wanted to see if we can incorporate these findings into a risk, a risk equation. And luckily, there was already a risk equation in the literature, but it was only validated in adults. And so this is called the KFRE, or the Kidney Failure Risk Equation, which actually used similar, similar um, variables that we just um, had studied in CKID, including phosphate, um, bicarb, albumin levels, um, GFR, albumin to creatinine ratio. So we went back to CKID and we applied this formula in the obstructive cohort to see if we could um, use it to accurately predict the five-year risk of kidney failure. So going back to our CKID cohort, uh, this time we, did, we, we, were, we ended up having a cohort of 118 uh, children uh, with um, EGFRs at baseline uh, uh, less than uh, 60 because this was the inclusion criteria for the initial validation study in adults. And we looked at the accuracy and the discrimination of this equation um, to predict which kids um, went on to develop kidney failure. And so what we found is that the five-year discrimination for the four variable and the eight variable were actually quite similar. Um, their confidence inter intervals overlap um, and that the four variable and eight variable both um, uh, inferior um, in this cohort compared to the adult cohort that it was validated in. So our conclusion was that although this did provide some level of um, prediction, uh, it's not optimal and that we probably need to look at other markers um, to see if we can improve uh, this, this equation. So this brought uh, me to my, my next phase of, of research, which um, was, are we really looking in the right place? If we're talking about a disease process like a, obstruction in posterior urethral valves, should we be looking at the glomerulus? Should we be looking at markers that re represent glomerular function? Or should we be looking at markers more of tubular injury since there's most likely an ascending process where there's injury to the bladder, to the, um, the tubules, and then to 
uh, the um, glomerulus. So I looked, um, did a literature search and identified some candidate tubular markers um, that I uh, wanted to then uh, see if we could uh, use in a novel way to predict um, progression of kidney uh, injury um, in patients with uh, urinary obstruction. Um, I'm going to skip these slides um, since it looks like we're um, going a little bit over. That was just kind of an overview of my thought process of why I chose those three markers. Um, but what we ended up doing is going back to CKID, um, this time also um, putting a request in for the NIDDK biorepository, where we actually were able to acquire serum and urine samples from all of these patients that I initially studied. Um, we did another nested case control study um, where we, the cases, again, were patients who progressed to kidney failure on follow-up and the controls were patients who had not. And we looked at the levels of um, the novel markers at both baseline and then over time. Um, at baseline, the plasma NGAL level um, was significant, was elevated um, quite a bit in the cases versus the controls. This approached significance, but probably due to our, our small sample size, we were unable to achieve significance here. Um, we also found um, that for the liver fatty acid binding protein, um, uh, there wasn't uh, very much difference in the plasma, um, but when we went down to the urine, um, the urine levels um, did appear to be higher. As, However, this did not reach um, significance either. Um, over time is when we were measuring these markers over time is where we really started to see uh, more of a difference um, with the plasma NGAL, the urinary liver fatty acid binding protein. Also, when we um, controlled uh, or normalized it to creatinine um, and followed them over time, we found that there was a significant difference in the slope of these markers going up as the outcome was approached. So the closer you got to the renal outcome of um, requiring dialysis or transplant, the higher these, um, uh, these markers got. We also normalized it or adjusted it for um, the baseline uh, GFR and uh, it did not change um, the, the finding. So this is independent of, of uh, starting GFR. So these novel, these novel biomarkers of tubular injury, I feel, are, uh, are an important component of um, prediction, uh, specifically because the mechanism of PUV is likely different than the mechanism of other causes of chronic kidney disease. However, we need to validate this in a larger cohort, and uh, we're working on this right now. Um, so future directions, I think, in the field of um, CKD prediction and uh, PUV is that we, do, we have preliminary evidence that suggests that um, urine, both fetal and postnatal, serum, uh, imaging, uh, genetics, and urodynamics parameters uh, all have the potential to uh, identify patients at highest risk for progression. However, we really need to standardize the way that we're following these, these kids. Um, there's a need for clinical pathways with um, research uh, component built into it. Um, to improve prediction models. And then lastly, these diseases are so rare, we really need to um, collaborate and build regional or national consortiums um, where we can um, better um, uh, identify um, which patients are going to progress um, to end-stage kidney disease. And um, I'm going to wrap up there. Um, and uh, I am going to take some questions. And I hope that everyone was able to hear the presentation well. And I got a question here. Hi, what's the value of cystatin C and at what age? Um, so that's a good question. Um, cystatin C um, can be measured both in the serum and it can be measured in the urine. Um, currently, uh, cystatin C has become very popular in the, um, the myelomeningocele um, population because it's independent of um, body mass um, which is obviously uh, an issue with patients uh, with spina bifida. In the posterior valve population, we have started um, checking cystatin C's um, early, um, you know, in the first year of life. Um, the problem is, is we don't know what it means. Um, it's, it, it, hasn't, it hasn't been validated. Um, at some point, um, I, I think that we will be able to um, give a little bit better of an answer of what these values mean in younger children. Um, currently, uh, what we do know is that, um, you know, once, it, once we're able to estimate their GFR, um, which is typically at the age of two, um, then um, we are using this, um, the cystatin C-based equations as well as the creatinine-based equations to, to estimate GFR. Um, Interestingly, what I've found um, working closely with our, my nephrology colleagues 
is the statin C becomes a really important uh, measure um, more in the older kids over two years of age when you see a bump in their creatinine, but you don't know what it means. Um, for instance, um, you could have a child um, that uh, is uh, short and the decision might be made to put them on growth hormone. Um, you could start them on growth hormone and they could have a, a growth spurt and they, their um, creatinine can also go up as well. And this is, can be challenging because as a urologist and as a nephrologist, we don't know if there's something we're missing. Maybe, maybe his um, bladder has decompensated, uh, maybe um, the family has stopped doing CIC, maybe they had an episode of pilo that we missed, why is their creatinine going up? Um, but if you check their, C their cystatin C and it's, it's, it's rock stable, um, that's a little bit more reassuring um, that it's just because of the growth spurt and the, um, the growth hormone that the child was given. So um, there certainly is um, some utility with cystatin C, but it's growing. Um, it's, it's, more, it's one of the, the newer um, clinically available markers. Um, and I think that um, you know, research is ongoing of exactly what the numbers mean in, in young children. And I don't think we know that quite yet. Okay. I don't see any other questions. Is there any other quote? Oh, wait, something came through. Oh, thanks. Oh. <laughs> I guess that's not a question, but thank you very much for saying thanks. All right, so it does look like, let's see here. You know, I rushed through the end of my slides because my timer here had said that I was already up to 50 minutes, but it's because I had opened my slideshow up a little bit early. Um, I see that we actually, I actually did have more time. So um, if there is any other questions, I'd be happy to answer them since we do have, you know, another five or five for 10 minutes or so. But if there aren't any other questions, uh, everyone's time is precious. And um, at least in my time zone, it's, oh, here we go. Are there any methods of ameliorating that mitigate the, are there any methods of amelioration that mitigate the indicators of renal prevention? So, so I, th I think that what this question is getting at is if we identify patients that are potentially at higher risk to progress to um, kidney failure, do we currently have anything available to mitigate that? And I think that that's kind of gets back to the point that there's two different ways of measuring risk. There's, there's the, the patient's risk of what they're born with, which is the functional renal mass at birth, which is what um, is estimated by serum nadir creatinine, which is what's estimated by um, ultrasound findings on a newborn ultrasound, um, which is um, potentially the PUV12 index of, of fetal urine. Those are things that are going to indicate a risk that we probably are not going to be able to change. Now, fetal intervention, um, is obviously um, something that is a whole nother topic. Um, but the kidney outcomes for fetal, fetal intervention um, really have not shown to be uh, much benefit to date and is more for um, fetal survival due to you know, pulmonary hypoplasia. Um, but if we move on to the other side of, 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 the, of the slide that showed um, that intersection between prenatal and postnatal, um, I think that there are areas um, where we can mitigate um, the risk on that side, specifically if we identify um, risk factors for bladder deterioration. Um, you know, if, if there was a marker of urine um, that became elevated uh, that indicated bladder deterioration resulting in increased pressures in the upper urinary tracts and increased tubular damage, that might be something that we would catch earlier and potentially um, put a patient on CIC or do a urinary diversion um, as compared to waiting for the secondary signs of that um, increased pressure or decompensation of the bladder, where uh, it may be too late to intervene. So I think um, earlier identification of, of some of these derangements could potentially be used um, to change um, the clinical course. Um, and also it, also, it helps in just disease, understanding the disease process as well. Um, if, if we can identify markers that um, are alter, alterated or, um, or different in um, different, different um, risk groups, 
then maybe we can learn something about um, why certain patients behave differently. And then lastly, I, I mentioned this, you know, preemptive transplant is, is a really important component of nephrology. So identifying patients early that are going to progress, um, I, I think is, 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 uh, is underrepresented uh, how important that that can be. Uh, in your current practice, not as a researcher, what do you use as a marker for prognosis? Um, so I, I mean, serum nadir creatinine in the first year of life um, is the marker that I use the most um, to, to give prognosis to families um, for, their, for their renal um, health. Now, unfortunately, that's not a marker that is readily available um, early on, um, since you really do need to wait for it to nadir. Um, a lot of times, it does become obvious um, at least approximately what group the patients are going to fall in earlier than having to wait the one year period. Um, you know, certainly if you have a patient that early on has a creatinine of 0 0.2, 0 0.3, um, you know that that patient's most likely going to do well. Um, but if you have that patient that, you know, their creatinine is hovering above 1, 1 1.5, and they're a month or two old, and that you don't really see much of a trend, um, that's a patient that's probably going to do poorly. Um, so I, I think that, you know, that's the best that we have right now is, is really is the serum nadir creatinine in the first year of life. Um, certainly ultrasound findings, um, looking at, you know, severe bilateral renal dysplasia um, is, is something that factors in, um, you know, how bad their, their bladder and their reflux is on um, VCUG. Um, we are getting video urodynamics on all of our patients at three months of age um, to try to get at least the base, baseline measure of their, um, their bladder function. We're getting DMSA scans as well to get a baseline level of their, um, if they have any scarring or dysplasia. Um, but, but for right now, um, I, I would have to say the answer to your question is, is the armator crayon. Okay. All right, so I would like to thank um, everyone who uh, participated and the, thank you for the questions. It's, uh, it's an honor to be asked to give this talk. And um, if you have any um, follow-up questions, um, you can email me, um, daryl.mcleod at uh, nationwidechildrens.org. Uh, um, and I'll be happy to answer any further questions. But if uh, there's no other questions, then uh, everyone uh, enjoy the rest of their evening.